And so we thought we'll just take a couple of weeks as worthy of a little more attention than that, the birth of the king, and we'll do a mini three-part uh, series. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And I want to pick up the narrative again at verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And we'll read responsibly this morning. I'll read first and then you read and we'll alternate. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And the angel came in unto him and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also hath conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Together, and Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. May God's rich blessing be to his word. May it be sanctified in the hearts, the minds, and spirits of God's people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this grand, grand privilege to gather together one more time with your people around the holy book, the word of God. Open it to us that we might see Jesus afresh and anew in his transcendent maj majesty. And Father, as we return to this simple story of the nativity, may the spirit of the Lord give insight this morning that will cause it to rise inside of us that we once again might be held in awe of your great love for us, that you would send your darling son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the ransom for our sins. Yes. Bless today in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. In the past, I will share with you that every day is a gift from God. Every day is a gift that God gives to us, and we don't know what a day is going to bring forth. And we don't know when we're going to meet God, or should I say that God would choose to meet with us, and that God will take us to another, another level in our, in our service to him, or God will show us something that's grand and majestic. And so I believe that one of the things that God wants us to learn to do that is to live life like it is an exciting adventure, like it is an adventure. You don't know what's going to happen next. You know, uh, some of you men went to see the movie uh, Unstoppable, and it was an adventure. There's a certain individual I know, I think they went to see it three times, the same movie. But it's an adventure. Now, in that movie, you kind of knew what the end was going to be. Okay, they got Denzel in the movie now. Surely Denzel's not going to get killed. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So you kind of knew, but it was still an exciting adventure. So you sat there on the edge of your seat wondering, was the train going to jump the track? Wondering if the combustible and the flammable and the toxic chemicals will go up and create a plume and kill a bunch of folk. It is the adventure that kept you riveted there in the seat. Even when you wanted to go to the restroom, you didn't want to leave, you might miss something. The adventure. I believe that God wants us to live our lives on the edge of our seat. 
an adventure, that every day is another opportunity to serve God. Every day there's a chance that God might open a door that has been previously closed, that God might put us in a situation or circumstance whereby he might use us to advance his kingdom, that he might use us to make him known to people not heard about him before, an exciting, exciting adventure. And so there was no way that the young Mary could have imagined that God would choose her, that God would select her. God is sovereign. That just simply means that God can do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. And he can choose whomever he chooses to choose, to do whatever it is he wants them to do. And so as I shared with you before, God is going to do some great things. And God is going to use people to work through to accomplish those great things. And who can tell that God will not use us? So if we just make ourselves available, we have ourselves on ready to say, Lord, what is it you'd have me to do? I am willing to do it. However you want me to use me, use me to your glory and advance your kingdom. And that's one of the things that I want our young people of our church to understand. That any time there is great problems, great difficulty, it creates an opportunity for a great and grand and majestic display of the glory of God. I was called back to my little hometown this past weekend, and they're, they're having a school closure hearing. And they're seriously contemplating closing the old gold and blue. Uh, Mount Hope High School. And so there was sort of a somewhat tense and emotional hearing that they had with the Fayette County School Board. And the whole county has been taken over by the State Board of Education. I shared that with you a few weeks ago. It crushed my spirit to hear it. the whole county, all of the schools in the county that I was born and raised, the test scores are so bad that the State Board of Education have taken over the county school system. And so I went up and I listened to the conversation. And when they called upon me to speak, here's basically what I said. I say, now, I don't know what the right answer is. Maybe the economy of scale, the decline in population, there's only 304 students, grades 5 through 12 in a school. They put their elementary kids in and they make enough kids. Maybe the school is so small that you can no longer justify having the building of is too expensive. And maybe it needs to be closed. I said, but this is what I do know. If Mount Hope was 120 out of 120 high schools in the state on math scores, and if Oak Hill was 118, I'm not really sure that the answer is to put all of them together at Oak Hill. There has to be a plan better than that. I don't think that 118 can help 120 a whole lot. We'll average out at 119. Well, if you close my hope, there won't be 119 schools left. So we'll still be last. My point is there's something grander, bolder, more transformative, more creative, more innovative than just sending a bunch of poor performing kids to another poor performing school. That's not going to fix it. Even if you close it to it, we must do something else, something grand, something creative, something innovative. And so what I'm suggesting that that's where we are in our society today. There's something grand, something creative, something innovative that needs to be done to turn the tide, the moral decline, the spiritual decline, the intellectual decline, the unprecedented breakup of the family, the apathy, the indifference, the lack of motivation, the lack of determination, the lack and drive. We need something grand, something spectacular, something supernatural to happen. And thus, with only one person in the universe that has the capacity to do that, and that's God himself. So those of us who know the Lord must turn our faces toward him. I just refuse to go out without a fight. I just refuse to give up without swinging. And so every day I get up with a determination and resolve that by the grace of God, Lord, I want to be where you would have me to be today, saying what you'd have me to do, trying to do what might make a difference in terms of getting people to see that Jesus Christ really is the answer and he really is the hope for our time. And so when you look at the historical context of the scripture during the time of Jesus' birth, it was bad. 
It was bad times. The Jewish people were under the rule, the ironclad rule of the Roman government. They were an occupied territory. The Roman troops patrolled the streets of Jerusalem. And they had con corrupted the whole Jewish religious system. They had bought off the religious leaders, and they were nothing more than palms and puppets for Caesar. There was no spiritual fire inside the temple. There was nothing going on at the synagogue. There was no real word from God. And so it was a bad, bad time, a bad situation that the people were living under. They were in spiritual decline, moral decline, intellectual decline, educational decline, socioeconomic decline. Everything was in decline. But God explodes onto the scene. He explodes onto the scene first by visiting Elizabeth and causing her to conceive John the Baptist. And now he visits Mary and he causes her to conceive because God is getting ready to do something grand, spectacular, supernatural. And all I'm suggesting is God still visits common people. I was down in Greensboro yesterday, as I shared with you earlier, and I was really, really blessed because I just love to see common people doing good, doing exceptionally well. So there in Greensboro, North Carolina, on East Cone Road, on a piece of property that didn't nobody want, this bunch of little church bought this property some years ago, and they held on to this property. And they labored and they sacrificed and they worked and they saved them. They were just working class people. End up, they end up building a facility, and I am not exaggerating. You could take 10 Grace Bible churches and put it inside their building. 10. Plus, they got another facility called the, the Power Play Center. Three or four Grace Bible churches. Bowling Alley. Movie theater. Athletic gymnasium, you name it, they got it because the preacher said, look, we're not going to let the devil have our kids without a fight. So they said, we've invested everything we have as parents, as people who love the Lord and love the kids and the families of our neighborhood to provide the best that we can for them to worship God, to serve God, to grow and to learn about God. Now, I'm not saying that we got to do that, but what I'm saying, we got to make a statement that we really do want to do something grand for the glory of God and that people really do matter and that we can never go wrong by giving our best to try to help people, giving our best to try to serve people. You know, my son often tells me, he said, Dad, those people are just taking advantage of you. I said, son, I know it. I said, but they got to stand before God for themselves. And they got to stand before God having robbed somebody else. Because what I tell people, I say, now, if I try to help you and you mess up, I'm telling you, you're robbing somebody else. Because the next person who comes along, who really needs help and who's really trying to do the right thing, and if you squandered away the blessing, God is going to hold you accountable for it. We never go wrong by trying to help people. And we got to be wise, we got to be discerning, because we don't want to postpone people's reality. And we don't want to prop people up, and we don't be a part of a codependent situation where we're not forcing people to face the reality of their situation or circumstance. But this world, this universe is about people. And God is concerned about people. And people will never believe that God loves them if they don't see God's people demonstrating a love for them, even though they're not deserving of it. Are y'all listening to me? People don't deserve what we do to try to help them. They don't deserve it. If they deserved it, then it would not be charity. It would not be grace. But we do it because of the grace of God. Well, having said all of that, we come to this text this morning. And I've read it in your hearing where the angel Gabriel appears unto Mary. And he appears to Mary during the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And he approaches her and he tells her she doesn't have to fear, verse 30, because she has found favor in the eyes of God. Now, we talked about this a little bit on last week, but it's worthy of revisiting. When the angel says to her, and the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Now, I did a little bit of research this past week. Pulled off my vine, the expository dictionary of New Testament words, blew the dust off of it because I haven't looked at it in a while. And I found something interesting. According to Mr. Vine, the word favor is actually derived from the same Greek word from which we get grace, a caress, 
The English transliteration is C-H-A-R-I-S. My daughter Carissa, I named her based on the Greek text, Carissa, grace. And so Vine says that the word favor derived from the word grace, and so at its root, favor means to be filled with grace. But he goes on to say is that God cannot show favor unless he's already first shown grace. And so in salvation, God shows to us his grace, right? For by grace are we saved through faith and the not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So God saves us by his grace. Since we're now saved by the grace of God and we are now filled with the grace of God in the person of the Holy Spirit, God is now able to bestow upon us favor. And so Vines suggests that favor carries the idea that in God's divine intelligence, God knows all of us intimately in his omniscience, in his divine intelligence. And so God, in his divine intelligence, and God in his omniscience can then choose to bestow favor upon us, favor which we have not earned or that we do not deserve, but the favor that's a result of the grace that's already in our lives, and that favor has, the grace has caused us to respond to the love of God, so we do certain things, as we do these certain things, we get ourselves in a position of alignment to where God then can show favor. Are y'all listening to me? Now, this is deep. He says, now, the grace is undeserved, it's unearned, it's unmerited. We receive the grace by faith. Once we receive the grace of God, now we start responding to the grace of God. We start responding in obedience, trying to do the will of God. As we respond in obedience, trying to do the will of God, we put ourselves in a position where God can then bestow upon us his favor. Now, we don't know where it came from. We don't know where the favor comes from. We don't know why we get the favor. And from the outside looking in, the favor may always look like it's unfair, like we don't deserve it. But God knows how we have responded to his grace in our lives. Are you listening to me? And so some people respond to God's grace, and they respond to it half-heartedly. They respond to it uh, somewhat shallowly, and they wonder why they are not experiencing the full joy of God in their lives. Some people just respond totally. They just abandon themselves and say, I just want to do what God wants me to do, how he wants me to do it, when he wants me to do it. And in responding that way, they get themselves in a position where God then can bestow his favor upon them. And so the angel was saying to Mary, Mary is a humble woman in a humble little town, in a humble little village, you have responded to the grace of God that's been upon your life. And because you have responded in obedience to the grace of God, God has now chosen to pour out his favor upon you. Now know what the angel does not do. He does not equate favor with material prosperity. Because if you look at Mary's life, her life materially did not change. They were working class people before the angel showed up. She was a now an out of wedlock woman after the angel showed up. And by the grace of God, Joseph obeyed the word of God and took her to be his wife. And now she became a young pregnant woman that still was working class people. The favor does not necessarily equate to material blessing. But the favor does equate to spiritual effectiveness. Spiritual effectiveness. And because Mary had God's favor upon her life, she would be spiritually affected in her life and how she lived her life. So she brings up her son as she was supposed to. She brings up her other children as she was supposed to. And in so doing, she provided the world with a saving in the person of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, she provided the world with a New Testament apostle in the person of James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James, you see. And possibly even Jude may very well have been the Lord's other, one of the Lord's other half-brothers. The favor upon her life caused her to be effective spiritually in living her life to the glory of God and have an impact on the lives of other people. 
So now we are 2,000 years removed from the angelic visitation to Mary, and we're still talking about the girl. We're still talking about her in the Protestant church. Now, we're not putting our prayer on no pedestal and trying to make her equal to the Lord Jesus Christ as they do in some other church denominations. We recognize that she was human, but we also recognize that she was a woman that was totally abandoned to the will of God. So abandonment to the will of God results in the maximum favor upon our lives. So he says, you found favor in the sight of the Lord. We read the other part of that text uh, in your hearing. Verse 28, he says it again. And the angel came into her and, and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Thou art highly favored. And so in the case of Mary, she was elevated above every other woman that had ever lived before her and above every other woman that ever lived after her because she was the only woman that was chosen to conceive and to bear the Son of God, highly favored, highly distinguished. What are you saying, Pastor? What I am saying is, is that God still is saving people by grace. He's still filling us with grace. God still wants us to respond to his grace in submission, in love, and obedience. And as we respond to the grace of God, we will position ourselves where God can then bestow more favor upon us. And the more favor that we have, the greater spiritual effectiveness that we can be for the Lord Jesus Christ, advancing his kingdom, being a witness, bringing other people to saving faith in Christ, having an influence for the kingdom of God. And so still, even in the 21st century, God is not bringing any other virgin-born sons into the world, but God is still planting the seed of the word of God into the hearts and the souls of his people. And God is still designed to give birth to miraculous things. God wants to give birth to miraculous things, to ideas that are based on the word of God, that can arrest young people's attention to their need to exercise discipline in their lives and not be sexually irresponsible, but to trust God and put their faith in God and entrust their sexuality to God so they can live the pure lives that God wants them to live so their lives are not derailed early in their teen years. God is still wanting to give birth to things and movements like that. You know, I got an invitation for a big conference in January up in New York where they're gonna come with, a, I mean, in Washington, D.C., they're gonna come with a plan 2025 is the plan. How they're going to save black boys by 2025. Now, I don't know what they're going to talk about because I'm probably not going to go because Jesus is not on the agenda. And we done tried about everything I know to try. And the patient is not getting any better. The patient is getting worse, you see. Any plan to save anybody, to turn about anybody's destiny, anybody's fate, that plan has to be anchored in the word of God. And somewhere the gospel of Jesus Christ has to be shared. Because there's just so much coming at young people today. There's so much temptation coming at them. They've been inundated. They've been overwhelmed. There's never been a society that is sophisticated as this society is today to package up sin and temptation in beautiful packages and offer it to young people. And so it's going to take creative spiritual ideas. It's going to take people of God really spending time with the Lord and saying, Lord, give me the idea. Give me a plan. Help me to reach a group of young people. Are y'all listening to me? I had a wonderful experience this past Wednesday night with our teenagers. We start this little chat time on Wednesday night with our teenagers. And so I went into my archives. I'm going to show this video to you, uh, you adults, because you need to see this. It's probably the prized possession uh, in my video archives. It was taped uh, almost 26 years ago. My son was just an infant. I remember watching this, this program on television with my son in my arms. I was feeding him. My wife had gone somewhere, and the girls were kind of running around. Uh, my two daughters, they were little, too. They were all kind of moving around. And my good friend, Reverend Ron Sherrod, and I was watching this episode. And it's called uh, Crisis in Black America, The Vanishing Family. And except for the hairstyles and the clothing, they could have did it yesterday. And I showed this to our teens, just a little episode to our teens this past weekend, and we, this past Wednesday, and we talked about it. And I was amazed at 
their understanding of the issue that was at hand. I was amazed and I was pleasantly surprised and greatly encouraged that they understood the issue that was at hand. And I asked them a question. I said, tell me, who are the poorest people in the United States of America? Can anybody tell me? They could. They told me who the poorest people in America were. The poorest people in America are black and white children born under wedlock. Those are the poorest people in America. I said, well, who are the second poorest people in America? And they could tell me that too. They say single black females giving birth out of wedlock are the second poorest people in America. They got a much greater insight than what I gave them credit for. The net worth of single black women in the United States of America is $5. $5 is the net worth. Now, I'm not saying this in a critical way. What I'm saying, that's the facts. That is the reality. So we're at a place that we've never been before. The family is so frayed and frazzled. The family has disintegrated down to the point to where it would be abnormal for there to be a young black man and a young black woman married and having children. That would become abnormal rather than the norm. That's where we are. And at some point in time, we got to figure out how to turn this thing around, and we can't wait to 2025. It would be too late in 2025. It has to happen like yesterday. It got to be starting today when we start trying to lift up marriage, lift it up to young people. This is how God desires for most people to live. Now, some people will be single, but most people should be married. And where it has to start is we got to convince young boys that there's nothing more noble that you can do. With your life, there's nothing more noble that you can do than to take a wife and establish a family. That is the most noble thing that you can do. It's not running a football. It's not throwing a football. It's not kicking one. It's not catching one. It's not shooting a basketball. It's not running around a circle on a track field. At the end of the day, your legacy will be determined by whether or not did you leave behind any tracks in terms of a family, a wife, and children. Now, all of a sudden, we got this thing turned upside down. We are glorifying the irresponsible whoremongers. And we're making them the heroes for our young boys. We got NBA basketball players that got children in every NBA city. And we're lifting them up as some paragons of virtue. We got entertainers that they exchange their wives like they're changing their entertainment clothing. These are not role models. These are not heroes. These are people that need to repent before God. And they're promoting a lifestyle that is destructive. And I don't care how you dress it up, how you fix it up. And every now and then it explodes. Look at these people. I mean, look at them. Look at them. Paris Hilton, Lindsay Lohan. And look at them. Their lives are just messy, just absolute mess. And they got enough money, they can do the most decadent, bizarre, crazy thing. And there will be people that are telling them, that's wonderful what you're doing. And they're paying people to help kill them. No, no, we got to rediscover, and we got to rediscover the church, and we got to lift up marriage, and we got to lift up family, and we got to lift up child rearing as being a noble thing. And the heroes from our community got to be the people who raise the children. That's why I come to the defense of single women. I come to the defense every single time because I say 99% of them would prefer to be married. But you can't make somebody marry you. And so they end up with the children. Now, I don't care how the kids got her. Yes, they did something they wasn't supposed to do, but the children are now here. So we have to come around them with nurture and support and encouragement to try to help them to realize we can break this cycle. You can have a vision for your children. They can have a better life than what you had. Are y'all listening to me? Otherwise, we can't turn this thing around. In the Bible, anytime God gets ready to do anything really creative, nine times out of ten, he goes and selects a man with a family. Because he knows a man that has a family is going to have some discipline in his life. He's not going to act a fool all the time. Because when he sit on he think, the bigger fool I act, I'm putting my wife, my children at risk. So what marriage does, it helps to domesticate the man. 
It gives him a responsibility for a physical place that he's responsible to protect. And a group of people he's responsible to provide for. And it causes him to be driven to do things when he don't feel like doing it. He might not do for himself, but he will do it for those that he know are depending on him to do it. So the very thing that we as men complain about is the very thing that's keeping us alive and keeping us from doing stupid stuff. Men will do stupid stuff if they don't have a woman to hold them accountable. Are y'all listening to me? Can I chase this rabbit just for one minute? I wrote a paper, I haven't issued it yet because it's too controversial, but I wrote a paper about two people that were contemporaries. Two contemporaries. Barack Obama, Michael Jackson. And what's the difference between them? If you look at their lives, the look, look at their lives, her Obama was raised in a family that was predominantly Caucasian most of his life. But from a distance, he realized, I'm an African-American man, so he's looking at Martin Luther King and other people who his role models from a distance. Michael Jackson was born in a Gary, Indiana of all places. But where their lives changed that is that Michael Jackson never had, except for his mother, a black woman in his life to hold him accountable was what he was supposed to be doing. And so he drifted further and further away from his people, from his identity, so much to a point that he don't even want to be identified with the people that look like he looked. So he produced kids that he wasn't in the biological fathers of because had he been the biological father, they would look like him before he changed himself. This is deep. This is deep. But on the other hand, Barack Obama comes to himself and it had nothing to do with him going to Harvard Law School. It had something to do with him getting an internship in a law firm in Chicago and he met a young woman named Michelle Johnson. That's what changed his life. That's what turned his life around. He met a woman of his intellectual equal who could hold him accountable to his responsibility, to his neighborhood, and to his people. Y'all know that Michelle Obama got a degree in black history, don't you? This is a heavy sister, and she has helped him to understand what his role is and where his place is in this society. That's what a good woman can do for you, can help you understand where you're supposed to stand and what your role and your responsibilities is are, regardless of what her color might be. They give you a sense of you're accountable. They're going to they chew you out. They're going to fuss at you. You're going to argue. So you might as well get your act together. Are uh, y'all listening to me? Some of you men are to say amen. amen. Oh, I know I'm telling the truth. I heard Guy Brown testified his 50th wedding anniversary. You see what I'm saying? This is where we are. And that's why it's important that we have men in our church that are married. It's important that we have these young boys to see men that are married and have children that are living together and the children that y'all got the last same name. That's a good thing. We got to recreate a normal. And so God is getting ready to do something grand and marvelous and stupendous. And he chooses a family. Mary was already engaged to Joseph. So the, the, the betrothal, we don't understand that term, the betrothal in Hebrew culture, it was more binding than a marriage engagement that we might do today. They were legally already married when they betrothed to each other. They'd already exchanged the money between the fathers. The deal was already cut. It was already in die. All they would do, the betrothed, would, then they would separate for a whole year. But that was practical. That practical separation was so that the father of the groom wanted to make sure that his son was not getting anything more than a wife. That he wasn't in an already made family. Can I make it plain? So they separated for a whole year to make sure that he would be faithful and to make sure that she would be faithful. But God in selecting Mary was already choosing someone who had committed herself to be faithful in marriage. Are y'all listening to me? God starts with families because children need families to help nurture them, to mold and to shape them, and to discipline them, and give them an orientation of the world. So God chooses Mary, and he's choosing Joseph for this very, very special assignment of the nurture of the Son of God. Well, let me wrap up. I've kind of chased several rabbits today. We'll finish next week, however. 
So he says to her that she's going to bring forth a son. And this is a good place to close. Verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. The other thing that the angel had said to Mary, that she was, not only was she highly favored, but he also said that she was blessed. That's another interesting word. And all you're familiar with the Greek word from which it's derived is the word eulogy. Uh, eula legeo in the Greek text. And eulogy means to speak well of. So anytime there's a funeral, if they got eulogy on the program, I don't care how the person lived, you're not being a hypocrite to try to get up and speak well of them. Because if they live poorly, everybody know it. <laughs> everybody know when people live poorly, so you don't have to get up and regurgitate that. As a matter of fact, people could probably tell you something that you didn't even know. But you gotta try to speak well to say that this person's life had some redeeming quality. They did something right, and it's to speak well of. So when the Bible says that Mary was blessed, listen to this. What the angel was saying to Mary is that all we have heard up in heaven is God speaking well of you. God is speaking well of you. You are blessed, Mary, because God has eulogized you, not in the sense of your death, but God is speaking well of you, and God has now sent me to tell you that you are highly favored, and he's chosen you for a special assignment. What are you saying, preacher? What I'm saying, and we say we blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when we come and blessed when we go. Normally, we're talking about some material or some physical blessing, but the greatest blessing we can have is for God to speak well of us, to, for God to eulogize us. So when God speaks well of us, then it is no hard thing for God to follow up the speaking well of us with some tangible spiritual blessing, physical blessing, or material blessing that God might bestow upon us. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, God has spoken well of us. He's written our names down the Lamb Book of Life. Heaven is going to be our eternal home. If we don't get nothing else out of the deal, that's a pretty good deal to get. And all I got to do is occupy down here until my time comes. But when God favors us and when God eulogizes us, God also opens the windows of heaven and God pours out some blessings upon us and if we are smart and intelligent we will respond to God by lifting up holy hands praising God and magnifying him and testifying to everybody we see what great thing that God has done for us can I get a witness it is so easy for us to share the bad news with folk as a matter of fact when we meet people the first thing we want to tell them is the bad news why don't we flip the script and why don't we start off by telling people the good news of the things that God has done for us how he woke us up this morning how he went to the doctor can I get a witness and so when you start giving your health report don't start off with the high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high triglyceride. Don't start off with all that. Start off, I can still read the chart. I just can see the E, but I can at least see the big E. I got a little bit of sight left. Start off with that. Start off when the man put the signal on my head for my hearing. I could hear the buzzer once it got up real high. Don't tell them how much hearing you lost. Tell them how much you still got left. Can I get a witness? Don't start off by telling them you got to have a knee replaced, a hip replaced. Tell them you still got some college in your big toe. Tell them what God has preserved, how God has helped you. Can I get a witness up in here? Oh, we ought to be thankful to the Lord. That's why, that's why when you stomp your big toe, you ought to say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I can still feel the pain in my big toe. There's a whole lot of people can't feel the pain in their big toe. Oh, we ought to eulogize God. We want God to bless us. Why don't we bless him? Why don't we eulogize him? Why don't we speak well of him? Tell about all of his goodness toward us. Oh, I tell you what, if we start speaking well of God, 
in this pessimistic, negative, critical, backbiting, slandering world in which we live, we will get people's attention just by speaking well of God. You know, some of us find it hard to speak well of other people. You definitely should just talk about God. <laughs> to keep from sinning and, and being a backbiter and an underminer and a backstabber, just talk about God. Eulogize him. Speak well of him. Lift his name up. Testify. Don't let the devil rob you of the joy of speaking well about God. Because when you speak well about God, what you're in essence saying, I know him. I know him. I close with this. And I want you young people, some things you need to watch close. You see, we, we watch stuff, but we don't watch stuff close enough. This young boy down in Auburn, Cam Newton, oh, he's the real deal. Not just a football player. Not just a football player. You listen to him. They're trying to get him to say something negative about his dad. They turn to bait him into saying something negative about his dad. I don't care how they, how they try to phrase the question. He kept by saying, well, my daddy got my back. I know my daddy got my best interest at heart. This is a young boy who kind of understand at the bottom line is him, his mama, and his daddy. If his daddy tried to negotiate $180,000, that's just between him and his daddy and those other folks. The point is, the point that is so special here, he never allowed them to put a wedge between him and his daddy. He never allowed him, them to try to make him save his own neck by throwing his daddy under the bus. No, my daddy got my best interest at heart. My daddy got my back. I don't know what the real truth is, but I tell you what, if his daddy had got the 180,000, I bet his son would have got a cut of it. <laughs> but my point is, is that it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see. A young man who understands that my daddy is flawed. My daddy is not perfect. But he my daddy. <laughs> you see, but he, he my daddy. His blood running my veins. I got his DNA. I'm on this earth because of him. And all my athletic skills, I owe at least half of it, if not more, to him. He understand that. He's a different breed. He's a different breed. And it's refreshing to see a young man like this stand on national stage. Y'all ain't even watching this thing close enough. They've been after him for weeks. And his performance went to the next level. I mean, the last few weeks, he was just, um, just unbelievable on national TV under all the scrutiny, the way he played in the biggest of all games because the Heisman Trophy vote was going to be based on his performance on the field unless they all look like a bunch of hypocrites because he made it no doubt as to who the best But Even the other players were saying, now he should win the deal. He should win the trophy. We're going to go for the trip to go to New York, but he deserves it of the trophy. That's what I'm trying to say. Families got to stay together. We got we to gotta work it out. We just got to stay together because at the end of the day, the only protection we have from this cruel world that God gives to us is the family he puts us in. Our nuclear family, our extended family, and our church family. And if the family stays together, then God still has something to work through. He has something to work for. He has a place of operation. God needs a base. He needs a place to operate on the earth. God has always chosen to operate through human beings. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was his base of operation. He operated out of the Lord Jesus Christ. After Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, he established the church. Now the church becomes the base of God's operation. And the families in the church become the base of God's operation. So how we live, how we treat our wives, how we treat our husbands, how we try to raise our children, it's important. It really is important. It really is important. You know, somebody said to me the other day, well, you're just trying to help your own kids. I said, I'll be a fool if I didn't. I said, as a matter of fact, the Bible said I'd be a worse than an infidel if I didn't. I said, because I know when I get arthritis, when they take out my hips and my knees, and I can't walk, and my wife can't help me, they the only people I got to look to. Why wouldn't I want to help my own kids? What type of preacher would I be if I didn't help my own kids? I'd be an absolute fool. 
if I didn't help my own children. But I'm also trying to help your knuckleheaded kids and your grandkids because we got to help as many kids as we can. But I got to help my own kids. These are my kids. I got to help my own kids. That's what God put me here for. I'm through, but I'll tell you this. Now, I, I shared this the other day with somebody. We was talking to somebody. I was talking about, man, I ain't got no money. And he was crying. I said, man, how many, how many kids you got? Well, he got six kids. <laughs> I said, man, how you expect to have money? I mean, how you expect to have, What are you talking about? I thought you had a problem. You, you ain't got no problem. You got six kids. You ain't supposed to have no money. And then I gave my famous quote. I said, this, this is in the Bible. I know the first part is in there, and the second part ought to be in there. I say, the book says, we bought nothing into this world. And if you take a wife and kids, they're going to make sure you don't take nothing out. <laughs> now, if you treat them well enough, they might put a suit on you with the back cut out of it. That's all you're going to get. You ain't getting nothing else. They ain't letting you take nothing out of here. If you accept that, you can be a happy man. <laughs> you can be a happy man. Otherwise, you're just going to be a frustrated individual. Accept it, and you can be a happy man. Amen? Let's bow together, shall we? Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the great gift that you gave to us and his person. We thank you of the precious vessel of 